So we left off last time talking a little bit about the basics of bacteriology, including the structure, the way that they grow in terms of a lot of growth and a lot of kill. We spoke a little bit also about their genetics and some of their virulence factors. One thing that we didn't quite get to was some of their culture media requirements. I'll just briefly go on to that now. You will have to study that a little bit more on your own. I'm just going to briefly introduce it. But some things that we should know about is that, for example, homophilus literally means blood loving. So it's going to be plated on chocolate agar. It's chocolate because it's literally boiled blood. Gonorrhea is one of those organisms that's kind of difficult to grow. So it requires a special medium called Thayer Martin medium. And the way that I try to remember that is that Martin sounds to me like a martini. And if you have too many martinis, you can get gonorrhea. Another thing to remember also is pertussis. Pertussis is uh, Bordetella pertussis, which is grown on Bordet gangu media. And the way that I try to remember that is Bordet for debt, for Nutella. That's how I remember that one. Diphtheria is grown on medium with potassium telluride, and most gram-negative rods are plated on Makanki agar because it contains lactose, and so if the bug in question is a lactose fermenter, it turns pink. So this allows you to identify unknown bugs a lot more easily. Legionella is another one of these bugs that requires a really bizarre kind of culture medium. It needs charcoal, yeast, extract, and cysteine in order to grow. And fungi are typically grown on Sabarat's auger. And this should go back a little bit to what we were talking about at the beginning of the last lecture, which was the picture of the 50-year-old man with a long history of smoking who just came back from vacation with pneumonia. He's coughing. He's got high fever. And what culture medium should you need to grow the bug? The thing I was trying to describe was Legionnaire's disease. So the answer would have been in this case that Legionella grows on charcoal yeast with cysteine supplementation. So with that, in mind, we can go on to the next thing that I wanted to introduce, which was just a little bit about systemic infectious diseases. And this is a little bit different from the usual way to approach microbiology, because we normally just talk about all the different bugs, and then we talk about the diseases that they cause. But now we're going to come at it from a different direction, and that's because you've already learned microbiology and pathology, so you know about the diseases. So let's review a little bit, and this way we can refresh our memories and then proceed to actually talk about all the individual bugs that cause all the diseases. First thing we have to know is something about the clinical picture, because this is what the step one is going to be testing. So we have to be able to learn a little bit about something from the description of a question. Are we dealing with a local infection or a systemic infection? And from this, you need to know a little something about signs and symptoms. So if we have a disseminated infection, we want to see something involving multiple organ systems, and specifically something that looks like sepsis. So when we're looking at something like that, you should think about low blood pressure, vital signs just generally out of whack. So let's take this as an example. You're working in the emergency department and an 80-year-old woman comes in from a nursing home. She has altered mental status, high temperature, she's tachypnic, and she's got low blood pressure. And then what happens is because you're working in the emergency room, you don't know what's causing this, but it does seem like some kind of infectious process. So you pan culture her. You get a culture of her blood. You get a culture of her urine. And what you end up finding is that the urine sample, first of all, before you culture it, you just do a UA, and you see that it's dirty. It's cloudy. It has leukocyte esterase in it, and it has large nitrite. And then you see also that eventually, you know, two days later, you find out that her blood and urine both grew out E. coli. So what ended up happening was here was a urinary infection caused by E. coli, you know, the most typical bug that causes UTIs, and it stopped being a local infection because it got into the bloodstream and that caused the altered mental status. And you started to see, you know, clinical signs that showed involvement of more than one system. So that's a disseminated disease as opposed to just a local disease. Another thing you have to consider is the route of entry of some kind of bacterial pathogen. So let's say, again, you're working in the emergency department and a 42-year-old homeless man comes in after a syncopal episode. The police found him lying on the street. They brought him into you and it turns out that he is an IV drug user. He had a couple syncopal episodes. He's been running fevers. And on physical exam, you notice a systolic murmur where he denies ever having had one in the past. Now, the thing that you are trying to think about when you put all these pictures together is something that here's an IV drug user. And what's happening, you take a syringe and it goes through the skin, which has its own flora, and it introduces the skin flora into 
the venous circulation. So all the skin flora can then come to the heart and to the lungs and so on and so forth. And so what I was trying to describe over here was endocarditis, which does cause signs of a systemic illness like high temperature. The vegetations that grow in the heart valve can cause a murmur. And one of the things that can happen is that the heart doesn't pump as well, so you do get syncope. So you put all these pieces together and suddenly you can make a diagnosis from a nice history and physical exam finding. So having introduced that, let's talk a little bit about systemic diseases and some of the common bugs that cause them. Now, mind you, I'm only going to be introducing the most common bugs for the most testable questions. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be going over every single uh, individual bug that you learned about in your microbiology course. Now, could those possibly show up on the step one? Theoretically, yes, but it's very low yield, so I would then suggest to you to pay attention to all the other bugs when you're doing your reading, but it's not going to be very important to review for right now. So in no particular order, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about respiratory infections. Now, how do people with respiratory infections typically present? Uh, the big thing to always pay attention to are the vital signs, and specifically any kind of infectious process you want to pay attention to their temperature. Certainly for a respiratory process, you want to pay attention to their respiratory rate. And very often the heart rate also is a sign of the body under stress. So elevated heart rate is also going to be indicating that something is going on over here. Now, as soon as you start thinking about a respiratory infection, you should always be thinking that step one is going to ask you either what the diagnosis or what the treatment is. Now, for the treatment for respiratory infection is almost always going to require antibiotics if it's a bacterial infection. So let's proceed and talk a little bit about that. I've included a slide that shows two chest x-rays, one for typical and one for atypical pneumonia. Now, let's talk a little bit about what, what it is that we're talking about. For a typical pneumonia, the picture is somebody who is old and very, very sick. So this person is like 68 years old, and they've had this horrendous, horrendous fever and cough, and they've just been completely debilitated, and they've been you know, just in bed for the last couple of days until they came to see you. You get this chest x-ray and you see this characteristic lobar infiltrate over here. It's in the right lower lobe. And you can actually make out the fissure line, which is kind of nice because you can appreciate the anatomy of the lungs over there in this chest x-ray. This is the picture of a typical pneumonia. And the bugs that we like to think about typically are strep pneumo, Haemophilus influenza, and staph aureus. These are the big bugs that cause typical pneumonia. On the other hand, when we think about an atypical pneumonia, we get a slightly different picture. The person is usually younger, they're generally healthy, and they're not as sick. So, for example, you see a 24-year-old man. He comes into you for a persistent cough and low-grade fever, but he still has been able to go to work, although he's been feeling pretty lousy, and he says, Doc, you got to do something for me. Maybe I need a Z-Pack. People like the word Z-Pack because, you know, they've had it before, and then it makes them feel better. So you get a chest X-ray, and then you see the chest image that we have over here on the right side of the screen, which has a patchy kind of infiltrate, and it's a little hard to see, but in the left lung field of, at around the cardiac silhouette, there is a circle around a, a hazy area. And it's not a very impressive chest x-ray compared to the one with typical pneumonia, which really, really jumps out at you, that low bar infiltrate. But this is very typical for atypical pneumonia. I know it's weird to say typical and atypical over and over and over again, but in spite of the wordplay, we do have to know what kind of bugs that we're going to be worried about. So the bugs that cause atypical pneumonia very often on the step one are going to be mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, and legionella pneumophila. As you recall from the last lecture, there are a couple of key features that we had to remember. Mycoplasma does not have a cell wall, and it also contains sterols in its membrane. Chlamydia also is an endocellular. It's parasitic in that it lives in our cells, and Legionella has got bizarre culture requirements. So very important things to know about pneumonia infections. Also, immunocompromised people tend to also get infected with pseudomonas, and it's important to remember that people who are immunocompromised are usually HIV positive, or they have in the history some kind of recent organ transplantation, be it liver, heart, or kidney, because then they're going to be on immunosuppressants. So again, for the step one, always remember how to recognize somebody who's immunocompromised, because that's going to change what you're looking at in terms of the question. Let's talk about some other kinds of respiratory infections. Moving higher in the respiratory tree, let's talk a little bit about pharyngitis. So the main types of pharyngitis that the step one is going to ask you to know a little bit about there's the regular strep throat, which is caused by strep pyogenes, and this person has got some scratchy, you know, throat pain, low-grade fever, lymphadenopathy, usually just on one side, but it can also be two sides. They're usually not coughing. They're sick, but they're not horrendously ill. 
So you think of strep pyogenes, and we do give antibiotics because you do not want that to progress to rheumatic fever and, you know, uh, rheumatic heart disease. The other kind of pharyngitis that you should know is the picture of a kid who comes in. They're really, really, really sick. Really, really, really sick. The parents are really worried. Their throat is all swollen. And you're going to get something in the history, for example, that they are an immigrant and they're not immunized. Or it will say their immunization history is not well known. And by the way, for the purposes of the step one, if you are told that the immunization history is not known, just consider them to be unimmunized. Or they'll say something in the history about how they're big fans of Jenny McCarthy and they don't believe in immunizations. And when you see this constellation of things, and they may also give you either a picture of a pseudomembrane over the back of the throat, or they'll tell you that they'll just describe the pseudomembrane as a physical exam finding, you need to start thinking of diphtheria. And then they'll ask you another couple questions, either a characteristic about the bug, for example, you know, something like, what's its gram staining characteristic? Or they could also ask you something about the disease process, like, for example, to know that it involves ADP ribosylation of the elongation factor too. One of these types of questions could pop up, or you also ask a question like, what should you do in terms of immunization, which would be passive as well as active, right? So you're going to give them Ig, and you're also going to give them the theory of toxicity. So these are the kinds of things that you'd have to do. So moving on now, we'll talk a little bit about epiglottitis. This is obviously going to be an infection of the epiglottis, and there are going to be a couple of buzzwords with this kind of infection. You'll have a barky kind of cough or a baby that sounds like a seal. They'll say something like a seal bark, and they may also describe strider, inspiratory strider. And the bugs that we have to think about are Haemophilus influenza and Moraxella catarralis. And these bugs are very important because, again, you know, in kids, you have to worry about their immunization status because nowadays we do immunize against Haemophilus influenza. Another thing to notice is that epiglottitis is also caused by some viruses, which we'll talk a little bit later on in the course, but you obviously would not give antibiotics for a viral infection, but for a bacterial infection you would. So it's important to, you know, get some kind of clue as to what kind of bug we're talking about. The last piece of respiratory infection we're going to talk about is sinusitis. And sinusitis almost always occurs after a cold. Usually it's from a viral illness just because it causes some irritation of the tracts that drain the sinuses, which allow the bacteria to grow in these stagnating pools of secretions in the sinuses. And then you get a sinus infection, and the typical presentation is going to be somebody who's been sick for a while. They've had head congestion, maybe some frontal tenderness or maxillary tenderness. And the bugs to think about are, again, strep pneumo, haemophilus influenza, and anaerobes. And the big key to anaerobes is that there's going to be very foul-smelling discharge because anaerobes produce hydrogen sulfide gas. So that's going to be very, very stinky. And that's how you're going to know if you're talking about anaerobes. The next system we're going to talk about is the ear. So otitis is very common in two places. Otitis externa, which is going to be infection of the external auditory canal. And otitis externa is pretty much always in the step one going to be caused by pseudomonas, and that's going to be swimmer's ear. As you start to put these pictures together, you're going to start to find certain patterns. Like pseudomonas almost always comes up whenever there's like some kind of water involved. So for example, swimmer's ear, pseudomonas causes that as well as hot tub folliculitis, like those little pimples in the bases of the hair shaft from spending too much time in the hot tub. So again, you start to put these pictures together that when somebody's spending too much time in water, you have to worry about pseudomonas. Now, the other type of otitis you have to worry about is otitis media. And this is going to be only in little kids after about the age of six. Kids pretty much stop getting otitis media unless they have some kind of anatomical problem. For example, uh, people with trisomy 21, their eustachian tubes do not change orientation as they grow, so they tend to continue to get otitis media as they age. So which bugs are we thinking about over here? It's the same ones as we've been talking about over and over again. Strep pneumo, Haemophilus influenza, and Moraxella catarralis. So again, we should start to see some patterns that the strep pneumo, Haemophilus influenza, and Moraxella catarralis, they tend to colonize this part of the body, the respiratory tree, and specifically, you know, everything around and connected to the respiratory tree, including the uh, eustachian tube and the middle ear.